guys, my name is Rory and I want to show you how easy it is to download the graphing calculator software from Texas Instruments right onto your computer for both you and your students. So first off, I'm on the education.ti.com website. And if you um, take a look here at the main screen, you'll see it says COVID-19 COVID support and it says free software online for online learning rather. Click download now. I am going to go right through this with you to show you how easy it is. You're going to see there's two options. There's an option for teachers and there's an option for students. Um, I would encourage you, especially if you use graphing calculators in your classroom or any of the TI calculators, to have your students download this if they can on their own personal computer. It's free for six months, so they're going to be able to use this for quite some time and enhance their learning the same way they would have done been able to do in your classroom. So I'm a teacher, so I'm going to select software for teachers. And I'm going to go ahead and see which software I need. So I currently use the TI-84 CE Plus, I'm sorry, Plus CE. So I'm going to be using the first one. Um, if you use the TI-30 XS or the TI-34 MultiView, the scientific calculators, most likely in like the middle school setting, you would want to use the middle one. And then the TI Inspire, um, there's a lot of high school classes that use the TI Inspire. You can get that software as well. So you're going to just put in your email address. So I'm going to type in IP Algebra. Hit. How easy it is. I selected the one I wanted. Enter my thing. You can choose, obviously, Windows or Apple. I'm working off of Windows. Okay. And it says, once successfully downloaded, please enter the following license number. So you would use your license and you would plug it in to your account once it loads up. Pretty simple. Hey guys, so I just finished downloading the software and I'm going to guide you through exactly what to do next. So getting it set up on your computer, pretty straightforward. You're going to save it wherever you want and start installing. Um, when you're installing something that you want to make sure you do is keep that website open so you still have your access code available for you. All right, so my program finally loaded up on my computer, and now this pops up. Welcome to TI Smart View CE for the TI84 Plus family. It says you have 90 days left in your trial period, which is fantastic. Do you have a license number? So um, I do have a license number, so I'm going to press next. All right, I'm going to put in my information. And I'm going to, this is where I'm going to put in my license number. Awesome. This is great. This is so, so great. Okay. So it's showing me that I have my six months, which is fantastic. So good. Okay. Okay. So now it says use the emulator selector in the toolbar to see all available emulators. Okay. This is my screen, guys. This is amazing. This is the TI-84. You can see all of the buttons here on the left-hand side. Those are the same buttons my students would be using on their calculators in my classroom. You can see it's already showing up with the memory cleared. I always tell my students, guys, clear the calculators right away. First thing, second, plus sign, seven, one, two. And look at that. You saw my screen going through. I know I went kind of quick. And at the bottom is a key press history. So if you were typing something in online, sh making a video for your students saying, here's how you type an equation, and here's how you craft something, here's how you find information, your keystrokes actually get recorded at the bottom, which is really, really incredible. So a couple things that I want to show you that I went through with my students this year, just kind of off the bat, some super basics. First of all is, of course, clearing it. So second plus sign 712, that's our go-to. Next, we use it a lot for graphing. So um, I always have my students go to y equals, okay? And you'll notice when I press a button on the emulator here that it becomes red. And notice that keystroke also gets logged in at the bottom. And I'm just gonna move my little screen here so that I don't block anything. 
so you can completely see everything going on. Um, if I said to my students, hey, type in the graph, the equation for y equals x, here's where our variable is, x, just like it's on their calculator, plus 2. You'll notice that in this screen, it says y sub 1. I show them you can actually type in up to nine equations at the same time. Notice all the different colors. Each one becomes a different color when it gets graphed. After we type in the equation, we do that y equals. We then go over and click the graph button. And it graphs the equation for us. And the students at first are shocked. They're amazed. They're like, wow, I can't believe this is here. And then I show them so much more of what we can do. So the first thing I talk to them about is looking at the window. And notice the x-axis is the, pretty spread out the intervals. It goes out to 10 units and so does the y-axis, but because of the screen dimensions, we have a wider looking x-axis. But I tell them click on window and you'll see the window is set up exactly how you would set up your own graph. The x-min for the x-axis goes out to negative 10. The x-max goes out to positive 10. The x scale is the units um, between my intervals, so I, I always tell my students just leave it. Y axis is the same, negative 10 to positive 10. They could change that if they wanted to. They could adjust it. If they click on trace, okay, a cursor appears on that equation line, and they can right arrow and left arrow and actually follow the graph and see what it's doing, which is pretty amazing as well. One of the best things I show my students, especially for linear equations, is to do second graph. When they click second graph, they're accessing the table function. And here, it's an entire table, and the list just goes on and on. I'm going to down arrow this y equals x plus 2 equation. We're given all of the x and y coordinates for as positive as you can imagine and for tons of negative values. It, it's extreme how far it goes, much more than we would ever actually need. Okay, so here's just the basics now. So now what I want to do is I want to go back to y equals because let's say I wanted to graph a system of equations. And so I have that first graph in blue and let's say in red, I'm going to arrow down here, I want to graph another equation. So let's say I wanted to type in negative 3x minus 1. Negative, you have to use the negative symbol that's next to the enter uh, key. Negative 3x and then minus one. We have to make sure for syntax reasons we use the negative symbol when it's appropriate and then the minus symbol when it's appropriate. Otherwise, we'll get an error and it won't graph for you. My first equation I graphed in blue. My second one I graphed in red. And when I click graph, the first one's already there and now my second one is there, which is really, really awesome to see. So you can imagine the dynamic of seeing the two colors, seeing it on your screen, having your students do this on their own at home and really be able to check it out, which is pretty awesome. Now, if I click second calc, okay, so second trace, I can calculate the intersection of those two lines. It's not going to be a very pretty intersection, very nice number, but this is going to show us exactly where it is. So if I click intersect, um, what it's going to ask you is a couple of things. It's first going to ask you, is it at the first curve? So what I want to do is I want to let this cursor figure out the intersection between these two points. So notice it's on the blue line, y equals x plus 2. I'm going to press enter. Then it shifts over to the red line, and it's showing me a per point on that line, saying, hey, is this the second curve or the second line that it's going to be working off of? I'm going to press enter for yes. Then it's going to ask me guess. And if I press guess, it gives me, it actually was a very nice answer here, it actually gives me the exact intersection of this system negative 0.75 and 1.25, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, if I went to second table, which is second graph, not only do I have X and Y table that I showed you before, but I also have my Y sub 2 table. So I actually have everything all together. And if I was to up arrow, I have all of my negative X domain values with its range and so on. So you can really see how much you can get out of this, which is pretty amazing. Um, after systems and kind of going into other exponential functions, if I go back to y equals, I can clear each line. So down clear. When we were learning about exponential functions, let's say we did 2 to the x power. So I'd have to do 2, use my caret for my exponent. Notice that it goes gives me that sub, uh, superscript. And then x and then graph. 
So we talked about our exponential functions. We went along this graph. If I click trace, I can see the points 0, 1. I've got my y-intercept. I can continue to trace along the curve as it exponentially grows. Now, this might be a really good example for me to actually adjust my window settings even. So if I go into window, I might say, okay, my x min and max are fine, but let's say I really want to see this curve just shoot all the way up. I would change my, my y max. Let's say I made it, I don't know, 30. And my y min, since I saw that it's approaching the x-axis and I'm never going to get to zero or below zero, I might want to lay low on my y min and just kind of make it negative five, let's say. Hit graph. And now I can see much more of that curve. Notice my y-axis goes all the way up to 30. My y-axis goes down to a negative five. I kept my tens. I could always adjust it if I wanted to. And I'm pretty good to go, which is really, really, really awesome. Um, I could explore other things and say, hey, do y equals 2 to the x, and then y equals 2 to the x. If I wanted to put another number at the end of this, a constant, I have to write arrow out of it. And then let's say I did um, minus 3, and then press graph. So students would get that original exponential function. They would get the new function that they'd see is actually exactly three units below and make those connections for it. Now, my students, next, the next thing they're going to be learning is um, quadratic equations. So if I was graphing my quadratics, let's say x squared plus, let's say, 5x plus 4 graph. I can see my beautiful parabola. Let's say I wanted to go back to the way the window originally looked. I can go back to zoom and I can choose the sixth function standard. Brings me back to that scale of 10 in all directions. I can see where my intercepts are, but I can also use that calc function. So second calc and I can calculate my zeros. If I wanted to calculate my zeros, I could either see it, which I think we can all pretty much just see it, or I can calculate each one individually with a calculator. So this is gonna ask a couple questions. It's going to say left bound. So we have to put our cursor to the left of where we see that zero is supposed to be. So this point here is definitely to the left of where the parabola intersects the x-axis. So I'm gonna press enter. Then it says right bound. So now I need to move my cursor somewhere to the right of that intersection. Press enter and then guess it actually gives me that zero. It's telling me that zero is at negative four. If I wanted to do the next one, calculate another zero. Left bound, I would need to be to the left of this figure here where I see it's going to intersect. Press enter. Now it's saying, hey, bring that cursor over to the right of the intersection. It should be here. Then it says guess, and it gives me my other value at negative 1. So it's actually telling me my zeros of negative 1, negative 4, which, yes, appear to be very clear on the screen, but the calculator will also guide them through and show them that. Second graph, go to my table. I can show them the table values here, how we have the um, symmetry in the y values of negative 2, 0, 4, 10, and so on. So you have a pretty powerful view on the table values here virtually instead of on pencil and paper, which of course they could be writing things down along with you anyway. So imagine all you can really do with using this emulator to kind of guide the instruction. Students can type in along with you as they're watching the video. It's very, very powerful. So the last thing that I wanted to share with you is how you can easily get scatter plots on the calculator. Um, one of the activities I like to do with my students is give them some points, some scatter plot points, and figure out the parabola that would go through as many of those points as possible. So the function that I would have you go to is stat. And here in stat is where we can edit our lists. Our lists are the x column and the y column of the table that we would actually make our scatter plot points with. So if I go to stat, I now have edit. I'm going to press enter. When I open this up, I get my different list columns. And we're going to have L1 serve as the X coordinate and L2 serve as the Y coordinate. So I would enter in, let's say, all of my X values 
Um, so L1, let's say, is 3, and I want my L2 coordinate to be negative 1, so that would be the first coordinate point. And let's say I made another coordinate point of 2, and then 0. I could make another coordinate point of um, negative 4, and then 2, 0, 0, and then let's say I made another ordered pair of negative 1, and then 3. Now, to have these points actually get plotted on my screen, I would need to go to second stat plot. So that's the y equals function. Now, right now, it's showing me that plot 1 is off. That's the default. So I'm going to press Enter. I'm going to turn plot 1 on. So now you see the cursor is blinking on on. I want it to plot as a set of points. You could have a line plot. You could have your histogram, your box and whisker plots. It's saying take the X list from L1, which is what I mentioned before. My Y values are going to come from L2. You can choose the different kind of markings. It can be a square, a plus sign, a point, or a little even smaller point. And you can even change the color. So if I wanted it to be in magenta, I could. Now I'm going to press graph. And here's my scatter plot. So imagine you had your students plotting points. Um, this one obviously wouldn't be great for a curve, but let's say you said to them, imagine an equation that would be the line of best fit. You know, plot a line that you believe would go through as many of these points as you could um, as your best fit line. There's a lot that you could definitely do here. So this video was just to give you some quick glimpses into things that you can totally do. The go-to for anything when they start the calculator or end with it, or if they kind of get lost in their screens, is always to reset and clear. So it's second plus sign seven one two. And if they changed any kind of functions, it's there. The last thing I will mention, because my geometry students are living this life, if you have a student that's in geometry or any of the higher level math classes where you're actually working between radians and degrees, the way you change that is you would click on mode. And in mode, you'll see the calculator defaults into radians. You may want those students to click over and go into degrees if they need it. That way they actually get their correct values. And then second mode, always brings us back to the main home screen. Okay, so second mode brings us back to this home screen where students can actually do their calculations and all that good stuff. Um, clearing, again, is second plus sign 712. Press enter, and then they're good to go. Thank you so much. I hope this video was helpful for you. Good luck using it with your students, and we're all in this together, guys.